Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. Welcome back to the KT Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Now, 2023 is starting off to be, you know, not the greatest year for a lot of reps who are unfortunately and sadly laid off. And um, there, there are still companies that are, are hiring and there's reps that are perhaps sitting there wondering, you know, when, when is it my turn? When am I up next? And so the purpose of today's conversation is really to say we, we don't have to have that victim mentality um, where we're not getting supported, we're not getting trained, and we're kind of stuck in our head. We can work on ourselves. We can uh, really start looking first, we're becoming more self-aware and saying like, where can I get better? Where is there an opportunity that if I'm unemployed, like how can I really hone my skills to make myself more marketable? And if I am employed and it's a tougher market, how can I really stand out and, and be, become a top performer? So I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dave Kennett, who's a great guy. Um, he's a CEO of Replays and now Replays IQ, which does call analytics and really looks at the prescriptive data that, you know, data doesn't lie of what the top performers are doing. So, you know, if you're you're removing the guesswork and say like, how can I get everyone to be doing the same thing here? Great tool to to be able to support your team with. But we broke down, you know, both what sales leaders can be doing to create that coaching culture and what individual contributors can do to really, you know, take it upon themselves. And, and like we said, become self-aware is, where is an opportunity for me to get better? Like, where do I struggle? And some people don't want to slow down to really look inward. And Perhaps they're afraid of what it's going to reveal, but, but, you know, in my experience, you know, we got to start somewhere. We got to pull the curtains back and say like, why am I doing these things? Like, why do I get call reluctance? Why do I choke when I have a C-suite on, on the call? Why do I feel compelled to speak after I share the pricing? You know, things like that. And it's just like, well, why do I do that? Because once we're aware that we're doing it, we could be more mindful to get in front of it and start putting in techniques to stop doing it if it's not serving us. So Dave shared, you know, we, we went really tactical on this one. So a lot of AEs listening to this, you know, you have a great scorecard, a great playbook here to go from the beginning opening of the call, mid call and how to close a call. This is more B2B complex selling, but there's definitely some crossover to, to small to medium sized companies and even startups. But it really shows you what the, the top performers are doing. And some of you might say, great, I'm already doing this. Good for me. And some of you might be saying, wow, there's an opportunity to do things different here. Um, and and it doesn't cost anything. You know, so highly recommend you listening to this. And what I would also recommend is pause it and, and write this down and say, like, what can I do so it's more tactical and it's action oriented? Because if, when we write it down, we can just put action behind it and we get out of our heads and we kind of let let all the, you know, negative thoughts and lack of belief go because it's on paper. And so we're all, we're automatically creating this action plan. So encourage you to put this into practice. Would love to know, you know, what changes you have made or what have you incorporated and, and what successes or what improvements have those led to. So definitely uh, take a listen. Sales leaders, also great opportunity for you to, you know, create a playbook for your team to create a coaching culture let them in on why, you know, why this is important. Why are you doing this? So opportunity for you to show your vulnerability and your human side so that, you know, you become more relatable. And then, you know, you can support your team. And so it really begins with meeting them where they're at. And um, so great conversation. Um, enjoy. And uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. So you think about, you know, 2023 and where we're at, we're still in the beginning of the year, but there is a bit of doom and gloom out there when you think about the amount of companies that are laying off sales reps and, and they're looking for jobs. And, you know, there's a little bit of, I want to say there's a lot of doubt, uncertainty, and real people are getting in their heads and you have to wonder what, what can they be doing? And part of it, I would say, is looking inward and how can I work on myself? 
because there's so many things without, not in our control, but that is within our control. And so I want to uh, introduce Dave Kennett, CEO of Replays today, and i um, going to have a great discussion on what we can be doing both as sales leaders to really create and hone the coaching culture, as well as sales reps and what they can be doing to really increase their self-awareness as to what they can be doing in this downtime to prepare them for when things start improving to really um, stand out and, and become the differentiator for their, their customers. So Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Karen. It's awesome to be here. Appreciate it. Awesome. So listen, I, I want to really take this from the lens of, because the sales leaders play a, a huge role and, and so do the individual contributors, the AEs on their own. So I'm kind of going to take this conversation in, in two lenses, but I, I really want to focus it on, you know, the coaching culture and what we can be doing to support our people. And some of them are unfortunately been laid off. Some of them are new to sales and others still fortunately have a job, but there's always that room for improvement. So can you start by just giving us, I guess, a high-level overview of what you're seeing when, when you're speaking to some organizations about a coaching culture? Are they for it? Do they already have one? Uh, is this is there something they're thinking about, but they don't know where to start? Like, what's kind of that 30,000-foot view of, of a coaching culture? Well, you know, first, it is tough times out there for sure. And, you know, I'm at the age and stage where I've seen this a couple times before. And we'll get through it, right? But my heart goes up to those who have been laid off. And, and you know, once you get to a certain point in your career in tech, um, it, it's almost one of those inevitable things in tech sales, unfortunately. Uh, it's happened to me a couple of times. I don't think I know a single um, credible leader out there who hasn't um, been on the other side of the table on a, a reduction in workforce before. And uh, so, uh, you know, and then for the, the folks that are, are selling through this, it's absolutely key to do exactly what you said, which is take control, uh, take control, not be um, looking at this from a lens of fear, but a lens of confidence uh, and belief in yourself. And if you don't have that belief in yourself, your prospect will smell it. Uh, and if I think if, and it's important to have a self-assessment as to why am I not feeling confident right now? And whatever those things are, uh, the great news is those are usually controllables. You know, you can, if it's a lack of confidence in discovery or demo or what have you, but to more pointedly answer your question around coaching culture, um, what we're seeing right now is, you know, the whole like theory around um, conscious competence and unconscious mm -hmm. incompetence, that kind of thing. It's, uh, and for those who are listening, who maybe don't know that model, it's, you know, the best example, it's like that, that learning curve. And the best example is riding a bike. Someone who hasn't ridden a bike before, they look at it and, and, and they're like, oh, yeah, that looks easy. You jump on it and you, you fall off right away. And you're like, before you were unconsciously, um, in you've conscious, unco what is it, unconsciously um, competent, where you thought, sorry, you thought that you could do it and you couldn't, right? And it became very crystal clear very quickly um, of your conscious incompetence, of your ability to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. And then you start practicing. And if you really focus right, you can actually be okay at it. And that's conscious competence. And then there's the unconscious competence where you don't have to think about riding a bike anymore. It becomes quite easy. You don't even think about it. I think about the sales uh, journey that way. And I think that there's a lot of folks who think they have a call coaching, um, at like a coaching culture, and they don't. And I think that there's this level of um, just like someone looks at riding a bike, they're like, well, I bought gong, so I'm good. Um, it, it's just like, I know you're a runner, I'm a runner. Um, it's like that, you know, if I went out and bought a $400 pair of running shoes and say, all right, I'm just going to be a fast runner now. Well, you're not, right? I, I've, got, I've got good running shoes. But, and, and this analogy here is buying gong and then thinking, all right, we're good. Uh, the question is, I can't tell you, how often we see this is um, go to market. We, we get to talk to go to market leaders all day, every day of top tier software organizations. And what we're seeing is people don't have time to review calls. Um, they had hoped that their revenue intelligence tool, regardless of what it is, uh, um, will do this all for them. And, and it's like anything, of course, it's not going to do it all for you. So where, where we focus in is what are the things as leaders that we can do to leverage the technology we've got and leverage the skills from our team? And I, I know we're going to be talking about that today, but that's how I would think about it is almost like that ladder of, um, you know, conscious incompetence and, and sort of right up the ladder. And 
and in terms of how people think about their own culture as a coaching culture when mm, maybe it's not quite as honed as you think. Mm-hmm. I think that's great, Dave. And, and I love your first point about self-belief. And it's just for me as salespeople, I talk about this a lot, that if we don't believe in ourselves, like you said, they'll sniff it out. And they will because they're they're buying our confidence, you know, our ability to solve their problem. And if we are lacking that, they're thinking, well, you're definitely not the right person for me. And so I, I like what you said about that being front and center because I would agree with that. But it's also then that next point of where, you know, what, first of all, why, like what's contributing to this? Like why, why am I conf- not lacking confidence in this particular area? And so when you think about sales, is it prospecting? Do I get, do I choke up with fear? cold calling? Is it discovery? Is it the title when I see who's joined my call that I panic? And so I think that self-assessment is a great starting to point because you don't know where to start. You're just kind of saying, well, I suck at this. It's like, well, actually, let's take a, a step back and say, where are you? Is there room for improvement? But more importantly, why? Like what's contributing? Like where are you showing up in these areas where you have imposter syndrome or you feel that you're, you know, you don't have the right skill set? So I think it's amazing that you start in that belief because for me, anything downstream is for nothing unless, unless you believe in yourself. Yeah. And, and I think the the challenge we have with sales is our at bats are usually in a live game and mm-hmm. we love to use sports analogies in sales all the time. And it's, I think a great analogy for most, you know, most sports and, and, and um, the analogy of sales. But what I would say is in sports, often teams practice more than they play. And in sales, Hey, we're, we're grinding eight hours plus a day. Um, when do you have time to do those role plays and to uh, review calls and score calls, whether you're a sales leader or whether you're a sales rep? And mm-hmm. what I see as differentiators of true, amazing coaching cultures and organizations that have a leg up on the competitor, they realize that they can't have all of the at-bats be in a live environment. That's setting their team up for failure. And they, they have batting practice, right? They do role plays. And I, I think that, um, that in and of itself will give you an edge over your competitor. If you have competitor A and competitor B, competitor A never does role plays, never does call reviews. In their one-on-ones, they're not super strategic about how they leverage that time with their sales rep to support and enable them and meet them where they're at. Not just like, oh, hey, let's talk about discovery. But it's like, I listened to four of your calls. Um, I think you're awesome here, here, and here. Those are superpowers. Now let's look at these two things that I see as being key opportunities for you to take your game to the next level. And let's put a plan in place to help you with that. that that's what's missing um, in a lot of organizations. Some are doing it just fantastically well, but I'd say that's less than 5% of the organizations out there. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know, you know, these sports analogies are in the dating or overkilled in, <laughs> in sales, but you know, they're, they're the best alignment there. And like you said, when you think about the athletes, even Tom Brady, like right away, he would go back and watch game tape immediately because he wanted to know like where, what, what, what he did or didn't do. And so, like you said, you know, earlier you said, how can leaders leverage their tech and their skills? And I think that call coaching brings those two together because a lot of sales leaders, unfortunately, you know, they make the acquisition, they purchase a tech stack and it's like, we're compliant, you know, check there. And then they leave it up to their reps. And it's like, it's, they're not going to connect the dots. So creating a coaching culture is really leveraging the tech stack, but also them as the coach. And, and like you said, how valued and supported do you think your team feels when you go and you're really prescriptive and say, I listened to those four calls and these are the four areas. Like you've actually, you listened, you've done your homework. That feedback is going to be so much more receptive and valued because it's not blanketed. It's really customized to the person and to the stage and to the prospect or like the opportunity. And I just think, you know, that is, that is where coaching, as you said, you have a leg up and it separates people that are perhaps have a wandering eye for their company and those who want to stay because they feel valued and supported. Yeah. And, and for those listening who are sales reps and you might be saying, well, poor me, my sales leader doesn't take the time to coach me and, and what have you. And snap out of that victim mentality, right? We, it, you, more than likely, you haven't got... Um, a, a leader that's giving you a call coaching more than once every six to eight weeks. That's probably 95% of companies out there. So instead of, you know, waiting for that to happen and it potentially never happening, what I recommend is take, take charge of your own learning. 
take charge of your professional development. There's amazing ways to do that. You know, uh, most folks here are utilizing a gong, chorus, or, or others. Uh, and even if you're not, you're just recording your Zoom calls. That's fine too. Um, why not do a self-assessment and send it through to your leader and say, here's my self-assessment on what I think I did well and what I could do better. Or how about doing some peer assessments? I mean, no better way for the cream to rise to the top. If you are a sales rep and you're listening to this and you want to be a team lead and then in your career path and, and development, you want to be a sales manager, um, no better way than today to take control of your own personal development and demonstrate uh, by leading by example. Uh, so I, I would say, um, and, and trust me, I'm not saying this derisively. Like, do you think I was the sales rep sitting there, um, you know, taking charge of my uh, own learning all the time? No, of course I wasn't. So I don't mean to be pointing fingers. It might come across that way. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm more say it out of kind of love and support for people out there who are wanting the sales rep sitting around going, ah, I'm in this culture right now where I'm not getting the leadership I, I need or want. And I've been that leader who hasn't given my team leadership and development too. So I'm not pointing fingers there, but it's like, what can you about, do about it today? And there, there's a couple suggestions. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. And I was that sales rep who did take control and you spent my own money to do all this stuff because I wasn't getting it. So, you know, what you said is that victim mentality, like that ends today, because like you said, what I think here is if you start you know, reviewing your Zoom calls, really taking taking the initiative yourself, whether it's peer as a group or looking at your own calls, you are going to invite your leader to start following suit. And even though they didn't initiate it, they're still going to see the value. And they're also going to recognize you for, you know, standing up and starting this. So I think they're going to come on through osmosis after. So it's kind of like, yeah, you started it, but they're going to follow suit. But, you know, for, for people or individual contributors not to take their future in their own hands, spend a few hundred bucks to, you know, whatever technology you need, whatever support you need. I think this day and age, there's no time for that. You can't wait for a company who may never come around to support you. If, if everything else is good and you're happy, but you're, there's a piece of it missing, you know, there's no downside here because the money you set, spent, the, you're investing on yourself, but that's going to pay off. You know, the commissions you make is going to offset that small incremental upfront cost of whatever um, you needed to do to, to support you and your growth. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And for sales leaders who are listening, I mean, some we we all know that during busy times, it's tough to find time to coach because when we have periods like we had a year, year and a half ago, where we're um, hiring like crazy, you just don't have the time. And in, in, in periods like this, you, most of us are doing more with less. And um, if you're a leader here, you might be thinking, okay, that's nice and. Uh, you know, prescriptive, Dave, thanks. But like, I don't have the time. One, one way, you know, and I empathize with that, but one of the, one of the ways to kind of handle that is scale yourself. The way to scale yourself is look at the superpowers of the folks on your team and have them do some peer coaching, right? Every single one of your team members has a superpower or two, even your lower performers. Um, and uh, what you can do is, uh, and I've been doing this for years as a leader and it's worked very, very well. I started doing this maybe midway through my leadership career. I didn't do it in the early days and it, it changed the game. And if you do this and your competitor doesn't, your team will improve. And that is break your team into threes. doesn't matter if you're remote or in office. Uh, remote's just fine. And uh, say, okay, I want you once a week to get together and do role plays on these specific things. You guys decide the order of importance there. And um, one person's a buyer, one person's a seller, one person's the observer. Teach them how to give, give good constructive, positive feedback, because the gotcha kind of there is if someone's the observer and they're, they're kind of like an A personality and they're not very good at, you know, um, being supportive and constructive, that could be a negative experience for your other reps. So you got to talk about the positivity of coaching, et cetera. But um, assuming you do that, like imagine that as a sales leader, like you can sit there and do whatever admin work you have to do for that one hour while your team is, you know, off actually teaching each other and getting better and having at bats in, in, in an informal environment uh, where the stakes aren't high. Um, and then they can come back together and you can talk about your learnings and that kind of thing. You can do apply the same thing to, Hey, I want the three of you to get together and all share, you know, five minutes of one call that you're most proud of and three minutes of a call where you're like, man, this took a left turn. And I think I know why, but uh, throw it at me. The, the teams that will win and beat their competitors are the ones that are vulnerable, not afraid to, uh, be coached and not afraid to express where their their blemishes are from a sales skill perspective, and then the ones that are actually willing to uh, invest the time. 
Mm-hmm. And before I, I comment there, I think it's also important just with those those elements you said, they're vulnerable, you know, they're coachable. Like those are attributes you should be looking for when you're hiring salespeople. Like for me, if you're not coachable, like that's a red flag right away. But even showing those, mis- we, all make, we all make mistakes, but how can we get better and how can we create a safe space for someone to go like, look at, look at the response I got here or, you know, I kind of screwed up there. But it might, yes, it's kind of embarrassing in the moment, but I think it's a huge growth opportunity because someone else, you might prevent them from doing it. But it also just shows like what Karen showed where she dropped the ball. And then all of a sudden Tyler's like, hey, I had that too. And then there might be a pattern there that we need to go, okay, we're all doing this. Like, why is that happening? But if you can create that safe space to share the goods and the bads, you know, that's very powerful. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And speaking of being vulnerable, I'm not going to ask you to go back and edit my flub on the unconscious incompetence, blah, 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 blah. But I will go <laughs> back to it because I've Googled it as we've been talking here. And uh, just to, just to highlight that the pyramid goes, unconscious incompetence, right? You look at the bike, you've never ridden it before, you're like, that must be easy. Then you jump on the bike, you fall off, conscious incompetence. The next one is you start practicing on the bike, that's your conscious competence. And then finally, you're so good at riding a bike that it's unconscious competence. And that's the same that you're going to see once you start actually having these at-bats um, in a non-live environment of doing role plays and call reviews and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. I, I, I have a visual of that as well. But um, one thing I would also add, Dave, when you're saying the rep, you know, vulnerability and, and be, be coachable is important. But I would also say the sales leader needs to share those same characteristics. And when I find sales leaders that aren't vulnerable and can't disarm and show their human side and show that they're not perfect and they don't have the answers, you know, they become unrelatable to their team and therefore their team is perhaps reluctant to go ask them for help. So I would say those characteristics apply to both sides of the, of the fence. Yeah. And that's such a tough one, isn't it? Like, I don't know about you. I, I've worked in different cultures over the years where um, I think I was more my authentic self and more vulnerable in certain cultures than others. I was more willing uh, to take risks in front of my team and others in certain environments. And um, that would often be dictated in my mind anyway, by um, the tone that was sent, set at the top, right? If I was mm-hmm. a sales manager and the VP sales was more command and control, and I would then be more that way. And that was a rookie mistake. I, I learned then that, um, yeah, your team respects you less. If you're not willing to put yourself out there, be side by side with them, making the calls um, and in front of customers and getting more distance from the customer. And, mm-hmm. and so if you happen to be one of those folks listening right now who um, is maybe battling the same thing I battled, um, I would recommend doing it differently than I did. And, you know, don't fall victim to the culture, but be your genuine self. Um, be, um, you know, support the hell out of your team. Um, while at the same time, of course, supporting the direction of the organization and all that kind of stuff. But like, just don't be afraid to make mistakes. The, the team will respect that and appreciate it. And if they realize that you're not, um, they already know you're not perfect. <laughs> and if you think you are, <laughs> you're not fooling anyone. Uh, and so, you know, there's no harm in getting out there and, and, and learning together. Yeah, I think that's a huge uh, point. And I, I remember just working in corporate with when the, the message would come down from, you know, the executive leadership and you could see how different directors disseminated it. And some was just direct and, you know, just like a parrot and others, when they came to the team, they were like, you know, we, we got to do this. I don't really agree on this. So when it comes to this, I'm going to support you in this way we can do it. And I, and we all had so much respect for the person who just kind of, beat to their own drum we still had to be compliant but with with errors of our individuality and our authenticity to be part of it all and the other people were just like robots and and they just lost instant respect of their team because they're like they're not willing to try anything new or deviate from the message so like let's just try things on a little bit and see how it works yeah 100 percent. so talking dave about <clears throat> you know self-assessment uh, some form of scorecard that reps can take upon themselves I would like for the the reps who are listening now um, to to walk away here with some form of scorecard or framework or even techniques they can be doing at various stages of, say, the discovery call. Because what I'm finding is a lot of people, when you share an insight or a technique, they they don't know what they don't know, right? So some people think, this call was amazing. And it's like, well, how are you met? Like, based on what? (laughs) Like, what, what is this confirmation bias? Is there a physical verified? Do you have a metric? Like, how are you measuring this? So Could we start using a discovery and could we break it down from opening, you know, beginning, middle, end? And is there 
things you can point out at various stages that you're seeing that top performers are doing that people listening today could, you know, take notes and start, you know, incorporating this into their own discovery calls. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's start at the beginning of the call. And I think the very first thing is making sure you're jumping in prepared. It's like giving a speech. If anyone's ever given a speech at a wedding or what have you, you get less nervous if you've prepared. Um, and it, it's no different in sales. And it's amazing how much better you do when you walk into something knowing that you've thought through based on the persona that you are actually delivering your presentation or discovery to, whether it's a CFO or a head of marketing or what have you, um, that you've thought through um, what they care about. You've thought through what questions they might ask. You've role played in the mirror and with your peers um, how you might answer those objections. That right there is going to make this a much more appealing discussion for a prospect than the rep they talked to five minutes before talking to you who actually didn't do that. So I think number one, it's stuff that doesn't even happen on the call. It's preparing. Um, and what, you know, the nice thing about sales is uh, if you're a newer rep, um, you know, one thing that you can feel good about, you're going to screw up your first 15 to 20 pitches and that's okay. Uh, be okay with that. Just get through them as quickly as you can and get better every time. And for reps who have been doing this for a while, you, you'll know the, the top objections you're going to hear when you start with a new company um, or you're selling a new product, um, there's going to be about 10 objections of those. And those are, those will be 90% of the objections you'll ever hear. So that's pretty cool, right? Find out what those are. Just be amazing at answering those in an authentic way. And of those, you know, top uh, eight, nine, 10 objections, there's going to be a top three that you hear like almost every time, almost right away. And we're amazed at the calls that we review and we score how many reps aren't crisp and clear at handling those top three objections. You know they're coming. Uh, so I think the first one is to practice for those top three objections. Know your persona going in. How have you prepared? And in this day and age, I mean, we, not day and age, but these macroeconomic headwinds we have right now, we know um, that there's going to be more multi-threading than ever in terms of the different people you need to engage in the process. And the CFO is going to be involved most of the time. And if you don't have a tight ROI um, sort of metric to share and a believable, true case study and social proof, then don't even bother getting on the call. Because if your competitor does that well, you're going to lose the deal. Uh, so social proof, being able to have something that is tangibly um, consumable by, by a CFO and starting with that. Right. I think Peter Thiel talks about the start with the end, like right after you've, you know, uh, done your agenda and, you know, you're, you've done your intros, a little bit of, hey, how's your day going? All that kind of thing. And you get right into it. You know, never a bad thing to actually start with. Hey, uh, we're going to get into a demo later. I'd love to ask you a number of questions so I can customize that demo. Um, but by the way, uh, just to give you a bit of framework of who we are, then boom, 30 seconds of what your organization does. Put a case study on the screen and just walk them through it in 30 seconds. Um, and then they have the end in mind as you're going through the discovery, which gets them excited, right? Like if I, you know, think about it from a personal perspective, when you're buying something personally, whether it's, uh, you're looking at a trip somewhere or you're deciding what show to go do or what you're deciding what, whatever new product you want to buy an iPad. If right away, you know that this iPad pro that's got the M2 chip, you know, does this, this, and this. Because right? all we see on commercials from Apple when something new comes out, whether it's an iPhone or whatever, is the top three things that this new thing does that it, you know, the old generation didn't. And uh, it gets you excited. It gets you leaning in and it gets you wanting to learn more. Why not deploy that same psychology uh, at the beginning of your calls? Mm -hmm. I, I think what I heard there, Dave, is that situational awareness is that when they see where you're taking them, they're more apt to go along with you. Yeah, that's exactly right. No, that's a hundred percent. And so in the beginning of call, um, I think exuding confidence and uh, there's a lot of fear out there right now. A lot of fear. We see it every day in these sales calls and people who were confident sellers a few months ago might be that you feel your jobs in the line might be that you're a new seller. Um, it might be that you just need to uh, simply uh, survive and make money for your family. Um, and that's natural. That's human, right? Um, but people can smell it um, and mm -hmm. bad decisions are made out of desperation. So have confidence in what you're delivering and uh, find a way to have confidence, whether it's customer stories, 
I mean, if you don't believe in what you're selling, then you shouldn't be selling it in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and even what you said there about the desperation and people might be, you know, afraid of their job. And if they don't close this, you know, they're not going to make commission or they're going to be on a PIP or something. But for me, what that's where a process or a framework comes in, because I feel when you have, and I'm not saying robotic, but when you have something to fall back on, you're less, you're less emotional and you're less desperate because you're like, okay, I got to, I got to tell a story here, or I got to, you know, like you said, start with that purpose. And I, I feel when we don't have that, we're just floating and, and, and we can be taken or the call can be ended because we don't, we don't have our true North. We don't know where we're going. Yeah, that's right. And that true North comes with a repeatable process. And mm -hmm. in terms of beginning the call, before we move on to discovery, I would just say one of the top things we see reps not doing great is um, that lead that you are talking, the person you're talking to may have been an outbound generated leader inbound. Um, and it's important to frame context up front while you're doing the agenda, mentioning, hey, I know you spoke to Jane, who um, let's say Jane's the SDR who passed a lead to you and you're an AE. Um, let them know that they don't have to repeat all the same stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Talk to Jane. She really said that these are the two or three things that uh, you're finding challenging right now. And I'm really looking forward to digging into that. But is that right? Is that a fair summary of what, what you talked to Jane about? We see most reps don't do that. We see top reps consistently doing that. And what does that do? It makes the prospect feel heard, makes them feel like their time is respected, makes you, them feel like, oh, wow, I got someone here who um, is actually on the ball and I can, tr like, you need to try, we as sellers, not, you know, we all need to try and build trust as quickly as possible. And how do you build trust with a stranger in the first five minutes? It's tough. Well, um, you demonstrate that you respect their time, that you respect them and that you're listening. Um, and so that's one great way to do that. Mm -hmm. And think about Dave, what you were saying before those top objections, and you can narrow it down to three. I'm, I'm suggesting one of them is going to be, there's going to be pass offs. There's going to be a time waster. You know, they're the salesperson's adding friction to the sales process, because me as a consumer, that happens all the time. And it's so frustrating. So you're getting in front of it and you're completely disarming them with your transparency saying, yeah, like I spoke to Jane, just what you said right away, you've debunked a, a, an objection or a myth going in that they're starting to, you know, come down, be open to what you have to say, because you've answered a question or you put them at ease before they even had to say it. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's people sense very, okay. I love using this um, sort of analogy because we can all relate to it. We've um, all watched a comedy show before that's botched or seen a speech that unfortunately um, has botched. And what do you feel when you're sitting there in the audience? You actually want that person to win. We get uncomfortable. We clam up. There's something about the human psyche where <laughs> we just want them to do well. And we're all feeling uncomfortable if they're botched. Kind of like me with my little unconscious competence thing. It's like, where's Dave going with this? And, and, and right, it feels uncomfortable. And um, your sales, uh, your prospect is no different. When you're in a sales call, they can sense if you're not in control. They, they can sense they want you to succeed and they actually want you to guide the conversation in a consultative way. And that's usually a mind shift for reps, right? And a rep, especially newer reps think, well, customer's right. Prospect's right. You know, and they're always deferring to the customer. What do you want to talk about next? Where do you want to go with next steps? Mm -hmm. No, you're the expert and you're meant to be able to guide them through this process. Come across as the expert, control the call with a repeatable structure so that you can bring it back, which is why it's important to have a, a crisp agenda, but not in a way where you're, where you're, you know, in a way that the prospect isn't feeling like you're being controlling. That's a just, mm -hmm. we don't have to distinguish that, right? I'm not saying be controlling. I'm saying have a roadmap, stick to the roadmap, keep people on track and be the expert because your job is to guide them through this decision-making process. Why? Because hundreds of customers have come before them and they expect you to know what the common questions are and how to now help them how to help them navigate through that that decision making process. Mm -hmm. That's so important, Dave. And I think the word you mentioned there is guiding. Like we have to guide them because for me, when I'm in good hands, like I immediately I'm like, okay, these guys can help me out, and and I'm probably the worst customer there is. But the, the also, it's not just guiding me to purchase, it's helping me see around the corner. So like, what is it going to look like after we partner? Like, how often are we going to talk? You know, this licensing, do I pay annually? And so I think it's also just getting in the mindset of they're not professional buyers. So how can we guide them that they feel, okay, I trust this person. I'm in good hands. I, I genuinely want to work with them because that's what they're evaluating. If you're like this now, what are you going to be like when we actually work together? 
Yeah, hundred percent. What one thing I want to touch on here is I love what you said. All the preparation, you know, anticipate those objections. Multi-threading, absolutely. CFOs are most likely more involved now because budgets are tighter. But what are your thoughts? Or talk to us about. So I'm an I'm an AE and I'm trying to set up a call with a CFO. Are they going to take a call with me or will I need to engage my own CFO so I have peer to peer? Because what I'm seeing is most AEs are not coming prepared to talk to an ROI, a case study, and the CFO is just probably not accepting the call or going, this was an absolute waste of my time. So walk us through what they should be doing to really ensure that they are going to get that meeting in the first place, but that they're going to add value um, during the meeting. Well, I think you need your champion to be the one to engage the CFO most of the time. Um, unless you're selling a financial product that the CFO is the actual and their team's the end user, right? Then that's different. Um, but if it's, you know, a marketing tech that you're selling and the CFO maybe would come in in larger deals in the past, but now they're almost on every single buy that's over 10 grand. Um, that's where obviously you don't want to go around your, your, your champion. Um, and uh, I think I would, I would recommend walking uh, very early on asking your champion, um, maybe they're not your champion yet, uh, but they're, they're your point of contact so far. Maybe it's your very first call with them and understanding, um, and I'm, I'm, hopefully most people are, that are listening already do this, is helping understand what is the decision-making process for a, a buy of this size and of this type? Very simple question. And um, what we're hearing more frequently as well, yeah, I normally would have had uh, a no-brainer. I just give you my credit card and we, we do a deal right now, or you send me an invoice and away we go. But I need to engage my leader and I also need to loop in finance. That's where um, the top that's where the top reps are consistently differentiating from the lower performers by saying, okay, let's dig into that a little bit. Now it isn't uncommon for that to be the case. We've experienced that a lot lately. And uh, so showing empathy, showing understanding, um, and, and just being there to support them through the process. And then saying, you know. What we found is um, CFOs who uh, help in the decision-making process for this product are pretty interested in um, one thing, just or two things. What's the cost and what's the ROI? And often the cost is far less relevant. It's the ROI. Um, how does your CFO think about these things? And your person that you're talking to may be an experienced buyer and know, and then they'll guide you through that. And if they don't, um, then at least you know uh, that this is your chance to st you know stand up and be that expert and say great uh, fair enough uh, if if you haven't this is your first time purchasing something in this organization um, but what we find is that um, from an ROI perspective these are the key things uh, these are the levers that a CFO wants to see in fact CFOs love our product and here's why right relative to what you're doing today um, how does that sit with you right and then you know and so and then by the end of the call. Um, I think you, you want to get a sense as to whether your champion is going to be a good, doing a good job of communicating the ROI to that CFO. And if you don't feel like they're going to, then you want in front of that CFO. And you may say, this is where it's an audible at the end of the call. If you're not feeling like they're necessarily well positioned, and it's even okay to ask, Hey, now that we've chatted, like, how are you planning? To, can I ask you, how are you planning to position this for your CFO? There's this one customer reviewed a ton of their calls. Their top rep was head and shoulders above everyone else. And she did that thing very well. She actually did a mini role play with her champion before the champion went to talk to the other senior folks or CFO or what have you. And we all know you can't really get away with, you know, making your prospect you just met to your role play most of the time. So you got to read that one. I'm not recommending everyone does that. But if you can pull it off and in a way that it's not a role play, but just more be like, hey, you know, I'd love to understand how you plan a position with your CFO. If, if they're, you got the sense that they, they're not going to, I would just say as, you know, we work with hundreds of prospects uh, every month or whatever it is. And um, we get to see when things get approved and when they don't, is this something you really feel that you're leaning in with? And if they say yes, great. Well, we find that the chances of it getting approved, um, especially when a CFO gets involved is much greater if I can get in front of them and just share uh, uh, literally uh, a couple of case studies with them. Um, would that be cool if we just arrange a quick 15 minute call? I think that's the way to do it. You're demonstrating your, um, you're, you're giving them the opportunity first to uh, step up and, and arrange it. And if they're like, well, yeah, I don't know if I can actually speak to it internally, 
you're offering to do it. You're stating the value of why you do it. You're coming across as the expert because you're guiding them through a buying decision um, that you've seen that movie before. And you're also pre-qualifying them again. Like, hey, are you leaning in or leaning out? And if they're leaning in, you're like, hey, I want to support you. Just treating them the same way you'd want to be treated if you were the buyer. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, that was so much, so much goodness there, Dave. I completely agree. And, and you can see how, what it does when you take control, cause you're almost above looking down and you're like, you're, you're hovering over the process and saying like, first of all, how do you, how do you, what is your process? And then you're teaching them something, but there's always context versus I need to get in front of your CEO people, their back's going to go up. But I think those that don't take that approach and, and start by understanding their process, because then there's that, you know, that ability there to say, well, the reason why I'm asking is what we see, you're taking a real consultative approach and they see you as that trusted advisor. But when you don't do that, you're automatically in the weeds and you're like, well, and then it, you get, I've seen it happen so many times, you get so far behind and the person, you've lost that opportunity to really stand out because they're, they're lost in the details. And they don't see you as someone who's able to navigate their own internal waters. But but I think if, if done right, the way you're saying is that they're willing to say like, yeah, I'll put you in front of them because you're also empowering them. You, you've you already proved yourself that you know what you're talking about. And so when this person, your champion goes to the CFO to say, hey, Dave wants to talk to you. This is what he's going to share and, you know, give some background. You're making them look good too. Yeah, you, you really are. And I, I think there's probably a number of reps right now going, okay, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Captain Obvious, Dave. Like, we already know this. This is like Playbook 101. Everyone posts this on LinkedIn. Every But there's probably a number of reps who are listening going, man, that sounds scary. That sounds like it's out of my comfort zone. And it probably is. It was out of my comfort zone years ago when I started doing it. But you aren't growing if you don't push yourself out of your comfort yeah. zone. And guess what? You're going to screw it up sometimes and mm-hmm. you know, might be like, what's the, you know, it, it's that whole thing of how do you control your anxiety? It's picturing the worst possible outcome and saying, okay, is that really that bad? Like we, we ain't, we're not saving lives. You and I have talked about this before, Karen, mm-hmm. we're not saving lives here as sales reps. So stop taking the pressure. Uh, so stop having that much pressure on yourself and just think, all right, let's say it does push the wrong button with a prospect. So don't deliver it in the way that I meant. So what? That's one deal. And you're, I guarantee you that you'll get better at asking it. And I guarantee you, you're better off being more of a challenger type seller and getting out of your comfort zone. And after you've done that for a while, that's not going to feel like a risk anymore because just like riding the bike, you're going to be more comfortable and it's just going to come naturally. But uh, so for the folks, so for those of you who are listening going, I get it like cerebrally, I understand I need to do this. I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. Do me a favor. Just do it. Just try it today. Try it tomorrow. Try it in your next call and think to yourself, so what if I screw this up? It's not going to be the end of the world. Mm -hmm. No, I I agree. And you you know what? You think we talked about role playing and we talked about, you know, one-on-one and peer group coaching. Like there's also tons of practice ground there where you can role play and someone is the CFO and watching yourself. And so, wow, when I asked to get that meeting, I was really pushy there or my, I didn't pause long enough at, or yeah, pause long enough after I answered that question. So you can, you know, reduce the chance of completely screwing it up when you watch yourself and you practice. And like you said, it might be uncomfortable initially, but you become it. And, and it, that, that assertiveness and that kind of controlling the process, but got through a guiding confident way is going to become who you are and you won't even feel you'll, you'll wonder why was I why did that feel uncomfortable because that's, that's all I know right now and it's just a matter of time okay these are all amazing so let's in the sake of time let's move on to the middle so what are you seeing in terms of the top performers doing kind of that midway call sure um and and just you know if we if we're looking at your more transactional type motion right smb commercial sell five to 15 K ACV two week to 45 day close. You're going to have probably a um, more of a discovery and demo motion um, Mm -hmm. versus a more enterprisey type play where you've got one stage is discovery. Next one is capabilities and demo, et cetera. Um, But I'll, I'll apply some advice that overlap to both in the discovery. First of all, uh, I just, I I don't want to, I just want to mention the biggest thing we see is sellers not being present in the call. They've got this checklist of questions that their boss has asked them to ask and they go through them like a little checklist without really listening. And there's so many opportunities to dive deeper into 
Okay, tell me more about that. Help me understand how that impacts other people. From a financial perspective, can I just ask you, what are the KPIs that really tie to this? And one other thing, like what keeps you up at night? Like when you look at your goals this year um, and what success means to you in your role, like how does this tie into that? Those questions, they're easy to ask, but they're not asked very frequently. And, um, and, and so my, my overarching advice on discovery is if you're not, it's, it's like if you're playing 20 questions, when we're in road trips with the kids and we're playing 20 questions, they're great at thinking through, they're being present. They, they haven't been scripted on, well, you better ask this. They're like, based on what they're hanging on everything I say, <laughs> only when we're in the car and only when we play 20 questions, but they're hanging on everything I say. You, you, you understand that, right, Karen? <laughs> it's like, I do. That's um, but, um, and, and they're, they're, they're then thinking, okay, based on the new piece of information, what should I ask next? Cause I've only got 20 mm-hmm. questions as sales reps. I think we need to harness our inner child of like what we used to be like, forget the script, like just be interested in what they care about and how, what they care about may or may not tie to what you have and be okay with it not being a fit, right? Mm-hmm. What's your close rate? Um, and what are the, what percentage of time do you, you know, um, actually disqualify a lead? it's often greater than 50% of the time. So, you know, there's a 50, 50 chance. It's not going to be a fit. Be okay with that. And guess what? The minute you're okay with that, the minute they're going to, your prospects going to feel a lot more comfortable. So um, just on discovery, um, go deep, right? Understand the need behind the need, the peeling the onion, the pain, all those cliches. Just think of the 20 questions when you were a kid, just like, what do you really need to learn that is going to tie the need you uncover to what you can solve for them and establish quickly. If you can't solve it for them, you don't want to waste their time. And you know, velocity is everything, especially in this market. You don't want to waste your own time. So we can move into demo now, but that's, that's, that those would be some of my discovery tidbits. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. And I just think Dave is golf and many times we're trying to just kill it and think about when you just loosen your grip and you detach and you don't try to kill it. You can go twice as far And so I I think we're so caught up and we have to ask these five questions and we have to make this, you know, square peg fit in this round hole. And it's like, but don't, don't have that scarcity mindset because like you said, they feel it and you're pushing. And it's like, no, invite them to come along. And if if it doesn't, Hey, we're not for everybody. And if this isn't a good fit, we can't help you now or ever, you know what? Uh, Thanks for your time. Or, you know, maybe I'm able to recommend someone who can, but like that freedom is what's needed. And people are so scared to let go. Yeah. Yeah, in golf, you know, they say I, I, I definitely grip it um, t- too hard when I'm driving or what have you. And like when I've got the driver, I'm sitting on the tee box and the, the, you know, I've been told before by pros, like when I've had lessons, or whatever, like grip the club like you would grip an egg. No, no harder than that. And mm-hmm. it's the same. It's, it's, it's a crazy mindset to think about that because you equate mm-hmm. harder. I try more I focus better. I'm going to do but you tense up. And I, I think that's a great analogy that you use. It's like. Um, same in sales. Like if you just, Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there are some reps that we've coached that um, they really, really benefit. Uh, And by the way, I'm one of them. I'm one of these folks that benefit from taking 30 seconds for the call, closing your eyes before you jump on that zoom call or what have you, and just center yourself, just relax, just clear your mind. Um, And I don't do it every time. Um, In fact, I don't do it most times anymore, but when I do do it, the call goes better, I think. Um, so I, I think that I think that is a good way to relax is just to be mindful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so middle of the call, great question, great, great uh, suggestions there about just, you know, like you said, with your kids is, you know, just what did they say? Like pick, pick on that last thing they said and go deep on that. And, and if you don't get to your third or fourth question, who cares? But wouldn't you rather leave with some form of substance versus just surfacing everything? And then you're like, well, where do I follow up there? Because everything's on the surface. I've got no meat to dig into. Don't be afraid. And that's what they're looking for. If I'm telling you an amazing story and you pick up on, you know, the wallpaper in the background, but meanwhile, I just told you about my trip to Bali. I'm like, wow, I guess my Bali trip wasn't that interesting because he's more talking about something that's so, you know, insignificant. Your, our customers are the same, you know, when they're dropping that it's, they want to be, they want also to be the focus of the conversation. So how can we make it more about them more meaningful? And then they're more apt to let go and be like, well, these, these people actually care. And I think when you went back to how do we build trust is we, when we can show them and we genuinely want to help them, 
and sometimes that we can't. And that's that's helping them too by just saying we're we're not a good fit here. Like we're I'm going to cut you free and we're going to move on. That's helping them too. Yeah. And and that that leads to a best practice we really see, recommend because we see top reps doing this. And that is um doing what you said and taking the focus off of you and on to the prospect, but it, it doesn't stop there. It's like, how do you do that? Because yes, it's asking thoughtful questions. It's, it's genuinely being curious, um, naturally curious about their scenario and wanting to help them coming from a place of wanting to help. But I think it's also about making sure that here's, here's a trap that I, I don't, I'm going to guess here, but I'm going to say of the thousands of calls we've reviewed at replays with our 25 coaches, I think there's um, you know, of which you've been, you know, uh, have been an amazing participating coach and thank you is, um, they'll, they'll go through a, a whole motion of a call and they'll say, you know, I, they're in the demo, for example, like, I can't wait to show you this. I personally love this. Guess what? What's does the, does the prospect care what you love? Because, uh, they may have been, oh, your prospect may be a little jaded already thinking, wait, it's the Fox guarding the hen house here. Of course, this rep's going to tell me they love this. They're getting a commission on this. And you might be the most consultative seller out there and you don't mean it that way. But the best way to overcome this is a great little trick, uh, not trick. It, it, that's the last thing I want to equate with sales. It's not, it's a tip. And, and that is um, putting those things in a customer lens. Contrast me saying, let's say we're in a demo and I'm like, hey, Karen, I just love this feature right here. Check this out. Versus, hey, Karen, this next feature here, um, I do these demos all day, every day. And I also get to see customers who move forward and I get to talk to them and they just love this next feature I'm about to show you. And, he, and here's why, you know, it reminds me of Vidyard. Vidyard uses this and here's why the person in your role absolutely loves it. Boom, boom, boom. Contrast those two things. So I am talking just as much in both, uh, kind of, right? But I'm, it's my words I'm using isn't about what I think about something because you might be skeptical skeptical about my um, intentions there. It's about what our customers um, think about it. And, and it kind of causes this um, level of social proof and credibility and like street cred that you can't possibly give by telling them that you like something. So that's a, that's a little tip that will go a long way if you deploy it by just slightly changing your language and using that social proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And I just think of myself when I'm talking to, I don't know, say a phone provider or something, and I'm pretty frustrated. And they say, yeah, I understand, you know, where you're coming from. And I'm like, do you? Like, you've been here before, have you? And they haven't. So I'm like, don't say that then. Because again, right. I'll, I'll go for it. But it's like, I can imagine what I've, what I've heard is from people that have also experienced that, you know, it was frustrating. And so how we can help is this. But if you haven't been in their position, we need to be mindful. Because for me, I'm thinking, you close this, you get 20%. I know why you're wanting to push this. You know, so we have, we do definitely have to be mindful of, are we pushing our own agenda or have we genuinely heard what they have to say? And based on that, you know, we can share how others similar to them have also benefited and what those benefits are. Uh, so great points. Okay. So we're ending the call. We've, we've had a great strong opener where we've, you know, done our preparation. We've, we're confident, we're multi-threading. Uh, we've gotten our champion, you know, we've educated them. We've gone through the middle of the call. We're asking great questions. We're breaking things apart. We're going deep. We're being present. And how do we close this call off to ensure that we're, there's momentum and we're continually advancing? A couple key things. Um, nail the pricing when you get to the pricing and be crisp and clear about it. But before that, before pricing, you want to know if they're leaning in. And here's the biggest mistake we see happening. And here's what top reps almost consistently because as you know, we score thousands of calls. We get to see empirically what leads to converted deals. And this is, you know, because it's not me just kind of sharing for my health. Here are the things I think happen. These are the things that sales reps that convert deals do very well at top tier organizations. And that is, don't wait to the last five minutes to pre-qualify whether the person you're selling to is leaning in. You know, we did a study recently um, with Replays IQ on what is the difference? Is, is, I won't mention the name of the company, but uh, we've all heard of it. And they said, we want to know what our top rep consistently does well relative to the rest of the team. She crushes everyone quarter over quarter and uh, same number of leads, more or less same average deal size. You know, one of the things she was doing, she was uh, pre-qualifying whether the person was leaning in or out six times in the call, in a 40 minute call and doing it in different ways. And, you know, if you're listening to this, 
and you're just going to deploy this, this tactic, be really careful because uh, you have to read your audience and you have to do it in a subtle way. But she would do things like five minutes in, like, um, you know, based on what you've heard five minutes into the demo, like based on what you've heard so far, I'm just curious, like um, thoughts so far, or, you know, based on that pain you told me earlier, how does this solve it? I think it's obvious to me how it does, but I'd like to hear from your perspective. That's pre-qualifying, right? And she does that six times. Most reps wait till the last five minutes. So the first thing is don't wait till the end of the call to pre-qualify, but definitely pre-qualify at the end before you do pricing. Because once you deliver pricing, if they're turned off, you don't know if it's because of your pricing mm -hmm. being too high mm -hmm. or structure or what have you, annual versus yeah. month to month, or because of your you know, solution. You need to isolate those two things. And the only way to do that is to understand before your pricing, after the demo, before the pricing, hey, uh, I love to just pause at this point and just get a sense before I jump into pricing, how, how are you feeling about the fit here, right? Simple question, mm -hmm. who's going to be offended by you asking that? Um, and and don't, again, don't assume that, um, you know, I, what I would say to folks listening is don't assume that whatever answer they give you is where you should stop and keep going. If they're like, yeah, it's pretty interesting, then be like a dog on a bone. Like, okay, cool. What, what's the most interesting about it for you? Well, I think this is blah, 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 impactful. Great. Now they've given you that tidbit when you're telling the pricing and they, they start to kind of have a bit of rejection on it. Be like, well, you mentioned a minute ago that this is one thing that, you know, really is important to you. So when you look at the cost benefit, blah, 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 right? Um, so that's one thing is pre-qualifying number of times throughout the call subtly um, and then pre-qualifying right before uh, the pricing uh, to get a sense as to whether leaning in or not. And then when you go for the pricing, um, what we've with the top reps are crisp, clear, and confident. And um, we talked earlier about the importance of building trust. Um, there's no more important part of the call where the prospect's radar is going to be on high alert to see if you're BSing them or not. Mm -hmm. And um, and if you're BSing them, you shouldn't be in sales. Please get out of sales. You're giving the rest of us a bad name, right? Like yeah. this is, you know, and, and so... You know, it, if you're genuinely in this for uh, your prospect and, you, and, and it's a win-win for your company and for you and the prospect, win-win-win. But if you genuinely are, um, stand confident with your pricing. And a lot of folks in the call right now listening into this are probably thinking, well, hey, you don't understand my sales process. Like you're talking about a transactional process. We, we don't get into pricing until we've scoped it and it's the fifth call and it's three months. Well, fair, but I'm talking about whenever you get to the pricing, okay? Whenever you get to the pricing... Um, be crisp, be clear, explain the thought process behind it, um, if necessary, right? Uh, because if pricing doesn't make logical sense, i.e. Um, everyone wants their pricing to be recurring, but might not be a recurring model. Well, if you can't defend it to a prospect, if you can't defend it in a way that if you were the prospect, you would agree, then your pricing model probably sucks or needs to be tweaked or something. So assuming you can defend it, um, you know, be crisp, be clear. And then, and then, and then be quiet, right? It's like, okay, what do you think? You know, over to you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And um, it's that awkward pause, right? On that mm -hmm. one that always sucks, but the best reps do it. And for, you know, it's so tempting. And I admit, I still do this sometimes. <clears throat> I catch myself when I'm doing it, while I'm doing it. Um, and, but if you also, the folks listening also suffer from this, <clears throat> then I encourage you to try and, Stop yourself. <clears throat> Pardon me. Stop yourself. And the way that is going straight to the discount. You're like, oh, I'm going to show you the pricing. Da, da, da. And by the way, like, you know what? We've, um, I'm happy to give you 10% off here if blah, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> you don't have to give 10% off. Wait and see their response first. Mm -hmm. And you know, so that those would be, um, you know, aside from us moving to kind of the next steps at the end of the call, et cetera, that would be the main. Actually, let me just say the final thing is always getting that next meeting on the books, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. If they're leaning in, Book it while you're on the call. Almost all top reps do that almost every single time. If you're a top rep and you're listening, you're going, yeah, I do this. If you're a middle rep, you're like, I do it sometimes. I want to be a top rep. I should do it more. If you're a bottom rep, you probably don't do this very well. Um, and so that, that, that would be the end of call uh, suggestions I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing. And 
Just what you said there, those, oh, first of all, the silence piece, like last person, <laughs> next person speaks, loses, like put yourself on mute if you have to, <laughs> just to avoid hitting the discount button or just going, uh, uh, like you just, they can feel that panic. It's like, if you've demonstrated value, you've delivered, you've done a proper discovery, like you should know your worth and you should know that this is, this deal is reasonable and fair and ultimately is going to help you get where you where you need to go. So hold your, or your statements there. But one thing I love, Dave, is as you said, um, these meaningful check-ins along the way um, to really determine if they're leaning in and leaning out. And the beauty is like most people don't do this. And I get what you're saying is when they, they might do one before or may, they might not before the pricing and then they assume automatically it was the pricing. But that's a lagging indicator. These are leading indicators. If you can pause and understand, like you said, break it apart, interesting, or this is cool, this is awesome. Well, that doesn't help me. What part of it's awesome? Why is it awesome? What can you do with it? Then when you get to the pricing, you can come summarize all those things. And then it's going to like remind them again of the value it says. But when you're going blind or in these like, what do you think at the end of it? Well, what do you think about what? We've talked for 45 minutes. Do you, what do I think about the pricing? What do I think about the package? The part like there's so much. So I think people are afraid to just get that feedback. Like how, how is this sitting right now? How's it resonating? Is this exactly what you thought was going to happen? Can we on track here? And just, it shows that there's two way. I'm not just being spoken to. You're a participant. You're not a spectator. What do you think? Do I need to go more left here? You, you tell me. Yeah, well said. You're, you're a participant and you're not lecturing. I, I, I love that. It's true. And, and the final thing, actually, I, I, you know, so we, as you know, at Replace, we're a big fan of what we call Replace Best Practice, the meaningful check-in and doing that throughout. Don't ever go more than one and a half to two minutes without having a meaningful check-in, open-ended question on how they're feeling uh, thus far. Uh, but the other thing is being an expert and a lot of new reps are going to go, I just started with this company. How could I be an expert in this space or this industry? We know that you're not a real expert yet, but the best way to get there quicker is study the buyer persona. Ask the folks internally, what does this CFO care about? What is this head of marketing? Who I, you know, who's the buyer? What do they care about? What are the top three things in order that they care about? And how does your solution tie to that? And then role play the heck out of that. And then, um, really just understanding benchmarking from your own customer set, share two or three customer stories. If I just started with a company, that's exactly what I would do. I would learn three customer stories of different personas so that I could be a Swiss army knife and use those for the personas that come up. I'd be tight on handling my objections. And that's just like, again, you just have to be tight at really nine objections and mostly three, and then, um, understanding the persona. If you're a new rep and you do those three things, you'll be surprised. In your first 10 calls, you could look like an expert um, mm -hmm. just because you know the persona, the top things they care about, you've role-played the top objections, and you've got social proof to share with them. That's all we mean by being an expert. Mm -hmm. But but And those are really honed in because people are trying to, especially when they're new, they're trying to focus on everything. And I think if you just cut, that's laser focus, like you're cutting through everything in a real sharp blade there. Um, so I know we're coming out of time here, Dave, but why don't you tell us, because I know you've dropped so much value here and, and folks listening, there's no reason why you can't put this into practice, both at the individual contributor level and sales leaders. You know, this is something that you can really start creating that coaching culture, create a scorecard and really set the tone for how can people, you know, create this self-assessment. How can we create a support, a, a scorecard to really support them on their journey? People want to win. They want to get better, but we have to create the environment that allows them to do that. So Dave. For people who are listening and want to learn more about yourself, Replays and Replays IQ, where can they find you? Yeah, um, hit me up on LinkedIn, please. I'd love to hear from you or, or ping me, Dave at Replays.com. Um, absolutely. Any enablement leaders, RevOps leaders, sales leaders who are, are interested in, in really um, enriching their call recording data, whether it's Gong, Chorus, or what have you, uh, we just simply... Um, are able to tell you very quickly what your top reps do and why you close deals. We give your managers playbooks to use every step of the way. So I, I would I would love to hear from you or any sales reps. Like, yeah, I love to hear from everyone. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. We'll help them remove the guesswork. Well, thank you again, Dave, uh, sharing tons of insights and wisdom. As always, it's great talking to you. Um, so we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Karen. Great being here. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you all next time.